this and let you know why I feel that this is important to work for you. Okay, so my background, a little bit about my background is uh, about 20 years ago now, 20, 25 years ago, um, I, had, I had spent a lot of time in the field, I did a ton of uh, teaching, guiding, trip leading. Uh, my background is actually in clinical psychology. I felt I had I studied the brain, how does the brain work, neurology, all that kind of stuff. Went to Alaska, got all this experience under my belt, started trip leading, right, just like a lot of you. And then I, I put in almost 2,000 field days, and I thought I wanted to try something bigger, right? So I got a job at the University of Alaska Anchorage, running their outdoor department, which is a pretty big program. Um, there were about 50, we offered about 50 different courses. We had about 50 different adjunct instructors, we had some full-time folks. Um, pretty well-known program. And three weeks after I started, we had two student battalions. Okay? It was incredibly intense. I mean, I had spent a ton of my adult life trying to think about what would it be like if somebody died. Right? Probably everybody in this room has thought about it. And in hindsight, now I, I go around to the country and I say, I wish I would have known this, right? Because it's nothing like I thought it was going to be. And to be honest, it was a lot worse, right? It was super hard, it was super hard to get through. And in hindsight, then when, I, when I look back, I, because I get into the neurology and the brain science, it's like, what the heck? Why didn't I perform better? Why was that so hard? Why did all these people not perform better? So I started studying it. I started really getting into why do people make mistakes? Why do you make these people who, in this room, you will perform really, really well. And as soon as they turn up the heat, you don't. Right? And now with neuroscience, they have all, they have a lot of those answers. Right? They can figure out exactly what it takes to make a meltdown, um, what training works better, what doesn't work better. But for my history, um, I'll throw out a couple names, and I'll bet you know some of them. Our, our accident, you may have heard of it, it's the Tarmagon Peak accident. A lot of people have heard of like, the Mount Hood accident, they've heard of Tarmagon Peak. Um, following the Tarmagon Peak accident, we had 12 students, we had, there were 12 students, two instructors, and everybody was hurt. Right? Top protein fell, wiped them all out, two fatalities right there in the field, um, and 200 people involved in the rescue made national news. Right? I wasn't involved on the mountain, but I saw my name on CNN, right, of, of being a horrible human being, right? I got home on the media, and I was like, wow, and I was under pressure, and I did perform well, right? And I, I forget myself now, because I get it, I'm like, oh, I get it, I was human. The human brain doesn't perform very well under pressure, under highly, highly pressurized situations. Following that accident, Jed Williamson took me under his wing. Jed's one of my heroes because I was I was destroyed as a human being. And Jed helped pick me up and he helped me learn how accidents happen. I ended up going around the country. Um, I, I I mean it's kind of like making lemonade out of lemons, but it's like life sucked pretty bad for a while. But then a good thing came up is I, I got to do a lot of accident investigation, right? I was called in um, to figure out what went wrong. Why did these people make the mistake? And at first it was as an apprentice from afar, then I get closer, now I'm leading, now I'm doing the consulting, and now another thing that's kind of a bummer, but it's also kind of nice, is very commonly when a bad thing happens somewhere on the planet, somebody calls me. And I do, because my background is also in front of a site, I do post-traumatic stress for them. And so, and that's part of the book. In the book, one of the things I wrote is people who go through really bad events, about 75% of us leave the industry. Right? And so, but the 25% who remain tend to be really good risk managers. Right? They get it. They understand what's going on. So I took that data, I took that information and that experience, and I thought, how could I help the industry get a little bit better at this? That know what to expect, okay? So that's part of the background. Another part of the background has to do with uh, the science of performing under pressure, um, and, and the changes that have also been made just in not the outdoor industry, but in a variety of industries across the board. An example of that is in post-World War II, they did a really large study. Uh, one of the authors, his name was Marshall, and he studied combat. So he studied how do people perform when they're being shot at. Right? So they said live fire combat. Uh, the folks in the trenches were getting shot at. He interviewed tens of thousands of Americans.
American soldiers to see how did you perform. And he's, uh, how many of you have ever heard of this study? Okay, do you guys remember what the results were? He said about 75% of people hid. They did not fire their weapons. They hid in the box store because they were too freaked out. And the American military destroyed his reputation because they didn't want that to get out there. But they said, wow, maybe he's onto something. And then they, they started looking at why did they perform so poorly. And so a couple of examples that they gave is they said, well, first of all, let's look at our training. They said, we shoot at targets in a grassy field. They said, the, the soldiers were nothing like the targets. Right? So it wasn't close to what they trained. They trained here, and they were expected to use it here, and it didn't work. So that, that started the American government to look into what's going on with the brain. They actually spent a whole bunch of time and money looking at this. And now for neuroscience, um, they, they've been able to apply that knowledge across the board with military. Right? All military now does live fire training. Right? They put you up into live fire training. The same with fire departments, with police departments. Uh, with aviation industry, right, maybe simulations, because they realize that if we expect people to perform, perform really well, but we don't give them the specialized training, they almost always underperform. And I thought, well, shoot, that's kind of what we do. I mean, we cognitively talk about what we should do in an emergency, and there's some things to train pretty well with, but there are a lot of things we don't train very well with, and we expect people to perform well, and then when they underperform, we're kind of like, oh, I really thought Ambrose was better than that. You're humiliated, I'm humiliated, nobody talks about it, and then you end up with, um, you're depressed. Right? And that's pretty common, really. So what I'd like to do tonight is talk a little bit about, here's what you can anticipate. Here's what tends to happen in the brain during a really highly stressful situation. Here's what we can learn about it. Uh, and then here's how you maybe can change things so that if you're ever in this situation, uh, you will perform better. All right. So to start, I'm going to give you a couple slides about how the brain works. Okay, so there's two parts to the brain. Um, we have something that's very much like a hard drive. So the, the brain is really just a super cool computer. If you ever, if you give me more time, I'm going to like keep it till tomorrow and talk about how cool the human body is, how cool the human brain is. It is an amazing machine. We kind of got two brains. One's kind of like a hard drive, and one's kind of like a software. We're born with a hard drive, okay? So there's a lot of things in the brain that are absolutely automated, and they're going to come into play in an emergency, and some of those things are pretty hard to manipulate. You're kind of stuck with the size of your amygdala, right? You're kind of stuck with your disposition. But there are things that we can modify in the <coughs> automated system. This over here is what a lot of people think of as the brain, and that's like your software. That's your cognition. That's your decision making. But both of these parts of the brain are going to be affected under highly stressful situations. So another thing to think about is the brain likes organization. So you might think that this is what your brain looks like, or sometimes I think that's what my husband's brain looks like. <laughs> but really, as soon as data goes in the brain, the brain wants to organize it. Where should we put this new data, right? So I talked to uh, the last group that when I uh, tried this afternoon, the new data is initially just going to be housed temporarily in the hippocampus, right? It's kind of like a thumb drive. And when you go home tonight, or when you go to sleep, it's going to upload into your brain, right? And then it's going to upload into the prefrontal cortex. But it's kind of like planting a seed. If you don't sow the seed, if you don't water it, if you don't do recall, it's not going to grow. Right? If, so put it this way, if I gave you a random number right now, basically my social security number, I can almost guarantee it, unless you write it down, you're not going to remember my social security number tomorrow. Right? Because basically, it just, the brain didn't get that that was an important piece of data. Right? I simply gave you a piece of data, you go to bed, the brain's like, I don't know what to do with this. And so, it's, and so if it hangs out, the brain never sees any purpose of this number, it's going to going to house it in a part of the brain that's kind of like the junk drawer, right? It's going to put it in an old file. Why does that matter? Because if that's how you teach safety. If your safety briefing is a basic lecture, they will not be able to pull it out in an emergency. 
emergency, right? We have to at least get it to the desktop, okay? So most data that goes in is going to be housed in a part of the brain that's really hard to get to. If we can convince the brain to at least bring it up to the desktop, okay, we will have a better chance of, of pulling it out. What do I mean by that? Well, so a lot of you know this. It's things like spaced learning, right? If you don't know what that concept is, they, they've got a really good uh, research out there that say, I give you my social security number now, and then I give it to you in six weeks. They've actually found, I heard some people talk about come back in a week. They found out that six weeks is your best spaced learning. Here it again, wait six weeks, here it again, wait six weeks, here it again, wait six weeks, and the brain's like, geez, this keeps coming up. This must be important. And it brings it to a different part of your brain. Right? So you need to teach them, you need to give them back, you need to teach them, you need to give them back, and now I'm going to say, Pam, what did I just tell you? What do you remember from the last time? You tell me, what did I just remember? So you cold call the people and make them bring the data back up. And the brain's going to go, holy cow, this seems to be important. I'm going to house it in a different place. So it literally builds different neural pathways, right? And now it's put in a place where it's going to be easier for you to get to. Ideally, what the brain wants is it wants to reduce the clutter of the prefrontal cortex. So it, it would love it if you could create a habit, right? Because as soon as something becomes a habit, then it actually it's, it's solidified, and that's even moved to a different part of the brain, okay? So that you can recall that regardless. Okay, an example of that is tying your shoes. You tying shoes is so automatic that I can sit there and have a conversation with you while I tie my shoes because it's actually a totally different part of the brain that's thinking. Right? Like most people don't know that. Two different brains, and that's totally like in a nutshell, that's what we want to do. Right? Every single thing that you want somebody to do in an emergency has to be habituated. And that's what all research shows. So this is a, the, the picture, the visual of the limbic system, which is your automated system in the outer. And this makes it look like, um, well, it's basically the limbic system kind of like your fist, and then the cortex is like uh, the outer part of it. Okay? And then it's all housed in a pelican case. Right? So the jewel in the middle, the automated part of the brain, this thing right here, that's the most important because that's what takes the lift. Then you've got the bubble wrap on the outside, and that's what gets filled up with a lot of good stuff. And then we have a cranial ball on the, the skull, which is like the pelican case to protect it all. So that's more or less the anatomy of the brain. If we look deep inside, let's talk a little bit more about that limbic system. The limbic system, this is what, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're able to see it in the back, but basically, it's a base picture. About 50,000 years ago, We had that much brain, and we did that. We just didn't have a whole lot in the prefrontal cortex. And so in order for us to live, this is all, if you don't believe in evolution, then you're not going to buy this part of the talk. Because this is all about evolution. Is you know, 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, we did not have a refined prefrontal cortex, and so the middle brain had to keep us alive. So if we didn't have, um, school shootings back then. We had predator-prey stuff, right? We basically had, we think about what threats go into the wilderness, right? What threats are going to be exposed to in the wilderness? And the, this middle part of the brain, super fast, primitive, is kind of like a, a hypercar alarm. And so as soon as, even if I like maybe look at Ashton, and his amygdala like, and that's all it takes, right? So if we have data comes in that seems even a minor potential threat, the brain's going to stimulate by releasing a chemical. Mo most of the time it's going to be uh, preceded by adrenaline. Like a lot of people know about adrenaline, right? So you're going to have this chemical that's released, and it's going to set you up in case there's an emergency. Some of it's super cool. So if we say right here, this is the chemical on guard, is if your body is on guard, for the potential for a predator prey, we have immediately. So sometimes what I'll do is just to give you an example, is I'll say, hey! and just by startling you, all that something <coughs> release adrenaline, right? Immediately, your pupils are open, the lens opened up and dilated to bring in more input. You actually have instant ability to coagulate better 
in case that predator kills you or attacks you, you instantly have less blood flow in your skin so that if I get ripped, I don't bleed to death. Super cool stuff it's happening with that inside the brain. And as long as we leave it at that, life's cool. But if we let that limbic system get out of control, it's going to keep pumping those chemicals into the system, which is going to make the prefrontal cortex go down. Okay? So a couple things that are just more trivial pursuit but kind of fun, is like this one right here, is the limbic system is incredibly good at memorizing patterns. Right? That's a big part of what kept us alive through the years. Because that you need to know that when you ate that berry last time, you puked your guts up. Right? It's got to remember that kind of stuff. It's got to remember that that animal over there is different than that animal, and that animal killed me. We, we use that data too. Okay? So an example, there's uh, some pretty cool experiments they've done. One had to do with uh, just playing cards. Right? They do this in college. And they'll have like four, so they'll bring one person in the room, and they have four decks of playing cards, and they'll say, if you draw a nine, so you get $20 to start. If you draw a nine or higher, uh, you earn a dollar. Uh, sorry, you earn 50 cents, but if it's a eight or lower, you have to give me a dollar. Right? So basically, you just draw out of the decks, and you're either going to make money or lose money. And you do that, and after about 30 draws, I think it is, the limbic system has already figured out the pattern, and it realizes that it's a rigged deck. And you, if you've got an MRI, it's like, warning, 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 because it picked up the pattern. And it takes over 100 draws for the prefrontal cortex to figure it out. Okay? So the limbic system is really pretty smart, really good at that pattern recognition. And now we're learning how to tap that into things like, it's usually what we call our gut feel. Right? It's like, well, yeah, you can call it your gut feel. It's because your limbic system stimulated something that gives you the willies. Right? So when you say, I just have this gut feel, I say, well, was that your amygdala you're doing? Right? And that's really what's happening there. So you can learn how to tap into that. You can learn how to actually make better decisions. Okay, your prefrontal cortex, I think almost everybody here knows what that is, right? That's your think like spot. That's the out here, super logical. This is what we generally say we want uh, to be really good decision makers. But the problem with this is that it's pretty fragile. It's kind of delicate, right? It's super fancy, uh, but it, we can actually um, create problems with it pretty quickly. So there are downsides to both too, right? So those are kind of the upsides. The downside is that when the prefrontal cortex is stressed, it's really similar to having a lot of applications open at the same time. There's just no way the brain can function as fast as it's supposed to or as fast as it can. So when you have a lot of stuff going on, I mean, study after study after study shows you, you just do not make decisions as well. Your, your prefrontal cortex just cannot work as well as it usually does when you're highly stimulated. Okay? So that's something we have to think about. This, uh, they talk about the multitasking, and that's, again, just continuous uh, research has shown under highly stressful situations, we're terrible at multitasking. They say, well, why do we care? Which I'm going to get to some slides. It's like, well, for me, I do a lot of crisis response training, and it's like, if you're in the middle of an emergency, Patient care is one task. Bystander care is a totally different task. Calling your office with an emergency after we put the uh, requirement for a rescue is a totally different task. And if you expect one person to take on all those tasks, I can almost guarantee they will not perform very well. Okay? Because we have to make sure that we, we recognize the potential here that it's just things are not going to work really well. Your, um, the uh, lighted ones, these are the, go back to the uh, military trains, there's a book on combat, and a guy interviewed all these police officers, folks who've been shot at, and all, it was like 94% of them said that they have abnormal distortion, or they have distortions in their cognition, distortions in the intake, meaning time went fast, time went slow, they didn't smell anything, they had no situational awareness. This is pretty common, you guys. I'm looking at a person with a broken leg, I didn't even notice the storm coming in. Right? I'm looking at this person with a broken leg, and this one's one that really happened, I don't even notice that three of the students went up the hill because they thought they could get a cell phone service up there. And finally, when I turn around and I look and I say, hey, where are these three? And they said, oh, they left about a half hour ago. And now you've got missing students? They're like, ooh, we don't want that. That's gonna, this is 
not going to go well, right? And you don't notice, right? You have to anticipate. You will get tunnel vision during that emergency. <coughs> when the limbic system is overstimulated, right? When you just have too much stuff going on and it feels overwhelmed, the primary uh, response is actually, well, I shouldn't put it that way. We have three, three pretty typical responses, okay? The one on the left is the one that a lot of people think about. They think about the panic, right? Tons of stimulation, and you're just super gripped, right? And you might do something highly unproductive, and that absolutely can happen, okay? Another one, and this is actually evolutionarily um, sound, believe it or not, is if go back 50, 100,000 years ago, and you're being attacked, sometimes it's like fighting. So this right here, we usually say fight or flight. Okay? Or faint. Right? So basically, if I am being attacked and I realize I have limited options, the amygdala goes boop and it presses this button and it secretes acetylcholine. And instead of having my heart go, it goes immediately drops my heart, takes my blood pressure, and goes, and everything relaxes, including some of my sphincter muscles. So I might pee my pants, I might poop myself. I might vomit, and then I faint. And predators don't eat sick prey. Okay. So if you have ever seen a tibia sticking out of the leg, and you faint because you don't like the sight of blood, it's just your big look. Right? So again, we don't want to be overstimulated by either or. Okay? The third one is the deer in the headlights. Okay? And so even though we don't want this to happen, whether or not this is the most common of those three, is that the average person spends eight seconds contemplating what's happening. Because it takes that long for this thing to, to recognize this is a true emergency, it's absolutely surreal, I can't believe this is happening. You have eight seconds usually where you just stare. And if a Mack truck's about to hit you, it's not good evolution. Okay? We have, our brains have not kept up with the change in society. Okay? So if it's only eight seconds, that's not a big deal. Most of the time in the back country, we can get out of that. Right? But I'm going to talk about how some of these uh, responses can affect us in, in, in an emergency. So let's just say, randomly speaking, what do you think happens to most people? So this is John Leach. He's a Brit. Uh, he wrote this book called Survival Psychology. It's a little bit dry, but it's quite good. And he studied many, 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 many people under highly, highly stressful situations, including things like uh, the World Trade Center, plane hits, wars, all this kind of stuff. And he said, you know, this thing, and he said, this is what most people do in an emergency. He said, so if I, had, if I were just to take a poll ahead of time and say, Holly, what percentage of people do you believe panic? And a lot of people will say 20, you know, 80, 90 percent. It's like, no. Actually, it's about 10 to 15 percent of people panic in an emergency. Okay, 10 to 15 percent of people perform very, very poorly, and they do something that's highly detrimental. 10 to 15 percent of people perform as if this happens all the time. Prefrontal cortex is perfect; doesn't even seem like they have a limbic system. Okay, but about 70 percent of people are a deer in the headlights, right? And they're they're basically kind of stunned for a bit. And that's what we have to anticipate. So, and this is if they're not specially trained. Okay? So here's what's going on. Data comes in, data is always going to go to the midbrain brain first. Right? We think we're really fast thinkers. You guys ever heard of the book Thinking Fast and Slow? Uh, what he's talking about is thinking fast is this, thinking slow is this. So thinking fast is the automated system. Any data that goes into the brain, the <gasps> shouting, the smell, like when I say smell, um, I'm coming up from Alaska, I'm very uh, cognizant of what uh, carnage smells like, right, a dead animal, because that could be a bear. So as soon as I smell that, ooh, I get that amygdala reaction, right? So smells, sights, touch, uh, all sorts of data is going to come in, and it's all going to go through this conduit called the thalamus, and that's this thing right here. It's pretty cool. When you go to sleep, the thalamus closes the door so you don't wake up all the time. Okay? Because we don't want that data coming in. But when we're awake, it's got to go through the thalamus, and then the thalamus is 
decides where do you go. Okay, the, the amygdala always gets first shot because again, that's evolutionary. It takes 0.01 seconds for new data to get to the amygdala. It takes 0.04 seconds for it to get to the prefrontal cortex. And you may go, well, what's the who cares? It won't really fast. It's four times faster to do this. And so very commonly, you will have already started your automated response before you even know what's happening. So here's uh, the prefrontal cortex during an emergency for most people. Uh, as soon as that data comes in, like I said, this is kind of the deer in the headlights. Your, your brain, your, your prefrontal cortex is going to look for data that makes sense to it. So here's an example. So you would ask about the bear attack call question now. So my husband and I, um, several years ago, uh, I live in the mountains in Alaska. I live north of Anchorage, in the big city. I tell you where it is, so you know. But I actually live in the middle of nowhere. We see tons of bears, tons of moose. I'm walking on the trail with my husband. The trail is about this wide, and thick brush here, and thick brush here. And at around 2 o'clock, and actually about right where you are, a uh, brown bear stood up, brown grizzly bear, right? Which is not a big deal. I'm used to bears, right? My big nose like, hey, warning. I'm like, okay. So we stand together, we're gonna do what we're supposed to, we're like, hey bear, because it wasn't an aggressive bear. I stand up, boof, 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 right? The ears are forward, because it's trying to listen, right? And then guess what? It wants to add it. It lifts its nose up like this, and we're like, hey, check them out, that's pretty cool. And we're like, hey, we're people, right? So you don't want to bother us, we don't want to bother you, we're standing here doing this. And he drops down, and then he ran away, which is what most bears will do, and he barked. And he barked twice. And when a bear barks, that's not a good sign. Because he's going boom! And then an explosion happened on this side of the trail. Right? And it was like a Mack truck at 80 miles an hour, and it went boom! And we heard boom, 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 boom. And we're like, holy cow, that's a two and a half year cub, and that's its mom. Right? And the mom comes ripping through the woods, and we heard. The only thing that assimilated the amygdala was the sound. Those are seared into my memory. And we hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, hear it, and she pops on that trail. And she turns and she runs straight at us. And her ears are pinned against her head, and her lips are pulled back, and she's frothing at the mouth, and she was making a deep, guttural clicking sound. And you have to imagine we are in a stress response. <laughs> so at this point, I see this thing coming, and my prefrontal cortex goes, okay, hey, Google, Google this. <laughs> Right? So it's like an emergency. No, I don't want to. 
behaviors in an emergency. Okay? Other things that, uh, this is, some of you might know some of this stuff, but like, for example, people gather stuff, they think that actually is pretty um, primordial. They think that that probably goes back a long, long way and that it has an evolutionary basis. Like if we just gather stuff, it might help us survive. Uh, they've learned this in the aviation industry, and if you ever crash, they will give you uh, orders in no uncertain terms to leave your luggage behind, right? Because a lot of people will actually they'll do the overhead binge, the fuse line is filling with smoke, and they're going to gather their stuff. And it's actually not because that's, I mean, for some people, this is my computer's from Lloyd, but it's actually, it's hell. Right? They're going to just start gathering stuff, and it's actually delayed people enough that they can get out of the plane, and then they'll die. So the aviation industry knows that, and they'll say, don't gather your stuff. Okay? This might not be a bad thing for us. I'm just saying, here's what happened. Okay? A couple other things that happen is people have a need to be with others. We are a tribal animal. right? We like community. And so when we go back to evolution, we want to be near each other. Pretty cool studies they've shown is that basically all primates have the same phenomenon. So they've, had, they've shown uh, some research they did. Uh, 50 primates had a bunch of apes. You guys are all apes. Okay? And we took this ape. Okay, so Nestor, we're going to put Nestor over here, and we're going to put him in a little gas, glass cage, and we're going to shock him. Right? It hurts. And he screams. Ah! And we don't like that. Right? Because our buddy just got hurt. Right? So now apply it to the back country. One of your students or clients gets hurt. They broke their leg. Ah! And all the other primates got stimulated. All your pulses went up. All your respirations went up. All your blood pressures went up. And we all like gather together and we touch. And as soon as the, the, the apes did that, your pulse came down, your respirations came down, and your blood pressure came down. And they found that the exact same thing happens in people. What do we commonly do? There's an injury. You guys need to go over there. One of the first things we do is separate them, which is the opposite thing that we should do. Now, that's not saying that you should bring them over here and add to the chaos. But if, if all you do is you don't even think about it and you separate them, that's why they're so stressed out that they climbed the building and basically were trying to get the phone going because they're really stressed out and you're not giving them any time or attention. So we actually need to have a bystander plan. We have to build an intra-emergency action plan how to deal with the non-injured people. And it's more than just some being nice. Okay? People want to check in with each other all the time. Okay? And so they want to know what's going on. But you can imagine the parents behind want to know what's going on. The people in the field want to know what's going on. And if your focus, your tunnel vision is on the person who's hurt or injured, and you push everybody else to the side, they're going to get stressed out, and if they don't have data and information, they're going to start rumors. Very, very common. You have to anticipate that. People are apt to do um, what they see. So again, that deer in the headlights, they're kind of stunned a little bit, and they're very commonly, they will look around for leadership. They will want to know, what should I be doing here? Many, many case studies of that. And it depends on what they see and what you can get them to do. Here's an example of, so they're very open to suggestions. Here's an example of how it didn't go so well. So my husband, so I used to guide him on McKinley, right? So my husband and I were on a McKinley trip. Uh, they had an unexpected camping trip, an unexpected bivy on the summit, right? Well, you don't generally want to camp on the summit of McKinley, right? So you can imagine it's extremely high winds, so high that the gloves of our clients blew off. Uh, two of the clients got frostbitten corneas and went blind. Uh, it was a super intense night in a snow cave to get through this thing. We got back down, the group got back down to 17,000 feet. It's still really, really windy. This has now been 36 hours, probably 50 mile an hour winds, blustering. And so Blaine, my husband, he gets a hold of park service and says, we're back. We made it to camp, we're all alive, there's a lot of frostbite, there's a going down. And the park service, who wasn't on the mountain, <coughs> said, you need to find some snowshoes. Okay, first of all, pretty hard to find snowshoes at 70,000 feet. Most people have left them behind. He said, you need to find snowshoes and stomp out a helicopter landing zone. And Blake was, okay. And he got, he went, and he went 
looking around and past a bunch of different camps and find some snowshoes, and now he's out there stop in the storm. He's stomping down a, a platform, right? And it's, like I said, blustery, wind blowing. It's got to be a pretty big area. He's getting knocked down. He hasn't had anything to eat. He hasn't had anything to sleep. So he's really stressed out. And he was getting really bad advice. Because if you think about it, if you're at 17,000 feet at 50 mile an hour winds, there's no helicopter that's going to come up. And he knows that. And in this room, he would say that. But guess what he did? He said, okay. And he came back and he said, I can't do it. He said, I'm too tired. He said, I mean, I would trust my life to my husband. And he said, I tried. I tried it for like an hour. I just can't do it. And I said, you must do it. And he said, okay. And he went out and did it again. You have to be very careful when you tell these people, right? If you said, take your clothes off and spin around three times, they go, okay. Right. <laughs> so you got to be really careful what you tell them because they're really vulnerable to suggestion. And they don't have much confidence, right? And we're probably not going to have much confidence. So if you call in and they tell you something, and now you might say later, why did you do that? What a dumb thing to do. And it's like, because you're under stress. I said it, but we underestimate the stress, we overestimate our abilities, and we are often surprised. Right? So I'm going to move on to, well, what can we do about it? How can we, how can we make this better? Well, simple checklists are actually have been pro proven to be quite helpful. And a simple checklist is not three, four, five pages of text. That is not what this person needs in an emergency. They need a really clean bullet point list. And it should not say, don't panic. That is not helpful. Give them concrete steps to do, because they're, they're vulnerable to suggestion. And if you say, here's what you need to do, and depending on what it is, it could be like, take care of the patient, the first thing you need to do. Okay, whatever. You say, the next thing you need to do, is you're going to call this number. Most people in an emergency, they're not good at telephone numbers. Fortunately, they'll probably be pre-programmed, right? They have shown that if I can add, if I can turn the heat up, you often don't remember your children's names. Right? You can't remember your own phone number, your own, your own date of birth when you're really stressed. So we cannot count on you calling up the right number with the right data, the right information, and have it written down really, really basically. Right? Have a bullet, laminated bullet point checklist of very concrete steps that you can do. Uh, this one here sounds fluffy, uh, and it's all what the military is doing now. You got these firefighters, the SWAT teams, Green Berets, Navy SEALs, they totally focus on breathing techniques. And they've shown that if you're good at this, and it's the breathe through the mouth, breathe through the nose for, hold it for four, breathe out for four, they said a few of those, you can instantly see your pulse go down, your breathing goes down, the amygdala starts going, it's chilling out, right? So that's what we want to have happen. So that's actually quite an effective technique. Uh, as I've already just sat distress, dis, uh, described, we don't like the brain doesn't like surprises. So if you can try to eliminate some of those surprises, it can be helpful. Um, this one here, uh, a lot of you know that imagery can actually work quite well with, say, star athletes, right? So a skier, you can sometimes you'll see, like in the Olympics or whatever, I'm about to do my run, but I'm not there yet. I close my eyes and I can actually visualize. And what they've realized is that if you're really good at visualization, you actually build neural pathways. They put the, the MRI in the head, and they've shown that it lights up really similar to if you were doing it, you're exactly, um, you know, for real. Well, shoot, we can do this one. I mean, I'm just going to walk you through how do you, how do you use that bear spray, right? Visualize using the bear spray. Got to do it first. Right, get that bear spray, pop the safety, spray it, remember what that felt like, and now visualize it really, really, really accurately again and again and again, and that's practice. It's cheap, it's real, and it actually builds neural pathways and they found that it works. Right? So if there's some kind of emergency response we want to help build, we can do it partially through imagery. Okay? Uh, in some of the books I read, there's all sorts of guys, and this is what they teach, especially in the military. And they said that if we, if our soldiers are absolutely to, um, to the limit, they're about to have a meltdown, we basically say, stop, breathe, focus on your breathing, have a drink of water. Right? Bring back a sense of normalcy. And a lot of times it will help kind of su suppress that amygdala a little bit and allow that prefrontal cortex to get up to work a little bit better. Research has shown that we will do what we 
practice. This guy, if you, were, if you heard me talk earlier, um, I spoke a lot about Anders Ericsson. So this guy has spent about 40 to 50 years becoming an expert on expertise, right? And so what he did is he looked at all the people who were really, really, really good at something, whether it's athletics or chess or musician, and he studied what do they all have in common? And that was some of uh, what I talked about earlier. But one of the pieces of data that he came to the conclusion about, and again, it's like we've got all sorts of performance labs now in, in higher education that they're, they're able to test this. So he said, basically, we will, you will never perform, I should put it that way, it is highly unlikely that you will perform better in an emergency than you do in practice. And when I learned that, like, it's pretty hard for science, I'm thinking, boy, we got to make better practice. Right? I mean, a lot of people, and not the most professional language, but we do a lot of half-ass practice. Right? And it's like, we think self-arrest or, you know, river crossing, whatever skill we're teaching, because I teach a lot of wilderness medicine. And when I see you saying, hey, I know that I'm supposed to take your pulse, but what's your pulse going to be? Terrible practice. Right? When we want to make sure that we hold people high practice, because think about whatever you've done, what you've done is practice, that's probably the best you will do in an emergency. So hold them, make, uh, hold them, hold them high standards. Make the practices real, right? So if you let them kind of walk around and find somebody with a beacon, but there's no pressure involved, there's no yelling involved, there's no smoke or screaming involved, um, you probably aren't going to get the same outcome. Realism matters. All the research says, and this down here, Research shows the brain is best able to retrieve information, to recall it, uh, if it's under similar circumstances. Okay? So when I do, I teach the woofer, the wellness first responder, my scenarios are pretty real. I bring in role players, they know exactly how to present. I have smoke, I have vomit, I have screaming, I have dogs, um, I have children, I have kids who are hurt and parents who are crying because their kids who are hurt, their kids are hurt, because you gotta make it real. I mean, if you want these people to perform under pressure, you've got to make your simulations real, right? Maybe you're not going to go to that degree, but I'll bet you can make your practice more real, okay? So going up here, uh, we talked just a little about this earlier, is if I talk about safety, if, I, if you do a safety briefing at the trailhead or at the beach, quite ineffective, right? I highly doubt they will, they will, they will be able to pull much of that out in a stressful situation. Talking's not a very effective method for that. Visuals are better. If I show you, if I show you how to use the bear spray, I show you how to use a sack phone, I show you how to use an enrage, it's better, but better yet is that you need to do it yourself, right? And then if you talk about, or if you go back to my talk earlier, and you need to do it again and again and again, hopefully so it becomes a habit, because if it becomes a habit, then you'll probably be able to pull it out in an emergency. So, if you're going to set up um, scenarios, if you're going to do some kind of scenarios with how you train folks, here are some things to consider. You can actually intentionally add stress. I do it all the time. <laughs> so a lot of times, I look at this and I say, well, all right, performing a new skill, add stress, performing in front of others, being evaluated in surprise is awesome. Here's what I'm going to do in a, in a medical scenario. I'm going to, first of all, have a videotape because I'm going to evaluate you not only in front of you, but I'm going to do a big screen TV during our debrief, and you know it's coming, right? And so I walk up to you and I say with the camera, say, tell me what's going on with your patient. And immediately you're like, Oop! and you might lose ear in the headlight, no problem. I turn the camera off, take a deep breath, right? Breathe in, hold it, breathe out, get your cheat sheets out, I give you clues of how to get better. I say, let's try it again. I do it again, bring that camera up. And I, if I have to, I turn it off again, and then I do it again, and I'm going to quiz you under pressure, and then we're going to watch it later, and we're going to get a debrief, and I'm going to give you feedback. Okay? I'll bet you can do it. Which, as you were at my talk earlier, um, one of the things that all that is showing is we're trying to teach way too much in a little bit of amount of time. Right? Because we talk, and they just don't remember it. It's like, no, no, you got to figure out what's the need to know, get them rid of the fluff, focus on the need to know, and teach better that stuff, okay? And if it's very, if it has to do with emergency, I would say teach it until they're pretty good at it. If 
you, if you think they're going to perform well, you'll probably be surprised. Uh, you can add, so things like this, a surprise might be, um, I have an unconscious patient, you approach the patient, and when he wakes up, he is not speaking English. Okay, and you're surprised, and immediately, I mean, all you're going to do is watch it. I mean, they're stressed out anyways, and as soon as he's not speaking English, you're going to see probably a deer in the headlights. Right? That's okay. That's what we're trying to do. It's kind of like public speaking. Like some of you don't like to public speak. That's actually, they said for most adults, that's the number one fear. Okay? So a lot of you probably would vomit if you were standing up here on stage. Right? Because there's just this this would be too stressful. Well, we just work up to it. Right? I mean, you talk, if you're gonna do a presentation, you talk in your own room, you talk to your dog. You talk in front of a mirror, then you talk in front of a friend, then you talk in front of a couple people, then you do maybe teach in front of 10, then you teach in front of 20, 30, 100, and you build up to it. It's the same thing here, right? We just need to, to get the amygdala used to this. It, it, public speaking is the same thing. The amygdala simply stimulates and it makes you uncomfortable. And so now you get to the point where, like, I'm not nervous right now. 20 years ago, standing in front of this audience, I would have been nervous. But now my amygdala is used to it. You must get your amygdala used to it, okay? Uh, if you want to add pressure again, that has to make it say, we need to get out, now, now, now. That adds a lot of pressure. Uh, working alone, anytime we isolate people, that actually is very stressful. And so if you are working all by yourself over here, I can assume if I'm like a trip leader or whatever and I see you, I'll bet you're pretty stressed, and I recognize that. I might come over and I touch you as soon as I touch you. Um, I give you a calm response. Actually, I'll give the rest of that story. So the thing with, because like, I kind of want to hang with Barry. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so I'll come back. We probably have a lot of these things on that, right? So um, my husband, he probably died, but I'm going to tell you this. Uh, my husband almost ran. You know, and like my husband and I both teach bear safety. It's it's your big one, right? And that's and he feels bad. I'm like, you feel good to choose. Right? I mean, you, you turned like this before the prefrontal cortex even got the message. Because, like, that's how it happens. And so I was right here, he was right here, and I am super focused, right? Tunnel vision. I'm like, ooh, 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 ooh. but I happened to see him turn, and I knew that if I touched him, it would calm him down. Calm voice. I touched, I reached over here, I didn't even look, I just reached over and I said, don't run. And that's all I had to say don't run, calm voice, touch. And he said immediately, he went, right, because we debriefed it, and he said, you're right. And so he squared up, like, hey, don't run. Of course, you mauled him, but hey. So he did. He got mauled. He uh, had his uh, face ripped off, um, had the titanium face. Uh, but he was on the ground, she was on top of him, and I was very fortunate in that my prefrontal cortex worked very, very well. And I knew in this situation I needed to get her off him, and so I looked around for what I could do to distract her, because I also knew she was just doing her predatory, and I shouldn't say it, it wasn't predatory, she was protecting her cub. Right? We were a threat to her, and all she wanted to do was eliminate the threat. So, uh, <laughs> and she, it worked. She immediately turned her attention to me, and I went, oh. <laughs> <laughs> And I dropped into the fetal position, which is what you're supposed to do, went absolutely limp, um, and she stood over top of me and breathed on me, Right? She was waiting to see my response, and it's like, play dead. And she looked at me, she said, you are no longer a threat. She looked at him, you are no longer a threat, and she ran down the trail. And I turned to my husband, and I said, are you okay? He said, where is the bear? I said, she's gone. We need to leave the area, because bears will often come back. Okay? So even though both Blaine and I are highly trained around bears, his amygdala took over. And that's, that's what I want you guys to realize, is that this is what's going to happen. We have to count on it. It might not go exactly the way you want it, but there are certain things we can do that can make it better. Here are some things that can reduce stress. The more knowledge we get, the more familiarity we get, all of these things tend to calm us down. The routine, the checklists, the breathing, and believe it or not, tons of research shows that laughter works. Okay? You gotta be a little careful. Because if you if somebody thinks you're laughing at them, they might think this is really inappropriate. Right? But as soon as you laugh, it's very soothing to the brain, and the amygdala is like, oh, I guess it's not as stressful as I thought. So, just practicing isn't good enough. So, if you say, let's practice with the bear spray, let's practice with the river crossing, let's practice with the man of reward, re entry, 
uh, capsized drills. It's like we've got to give them feedback too. Because if, if, if all they're doing is practicing, there's actually a decent chance for solidifying bad habits. Right? So we need to keep reminding them what the bullseye looks like, what really good looks like, so we can help them get there. Okay, any questions? <laughs> yeah. Um, so you mentioned visualizing your response if you might not be able to do something practical. Like. So, for example, every time I get on the light rail, I think to myself, what if the shooter came into the car? You got it, that's right. Um, and, you know, I'm probably not going to have friends uh, organizing a pretended beach. But I'm just as curious. Well, and exactly what you said is if you could, if you could practice that, that'd be great, but you're probably not. Right? But it's like, at least visualize. And they've even said, like, people who go on an aircraft who visualize where I'm sitting, what row I'm in, they do better. Right? So that is, even though that may not be perfect, it's better than nothing. But then you also have to realize, and so it sounds like just realize, thinking about, all right, so I could escape there, I could do this. But you, if you are visualizing something like self-arrest or, or bear spray, you also need to know what good looks like. Right? Because you can't visualize if you don't know what really good looks like. Because you don't want to be visualizing it all day. As long as you know what, if you have a good plan of action and you visualize it, that will help you code. Any other questions? Yeah? I just have a question. So my son has a virtual, virtual reality video game. Mm -hmm. Have you guys ever thought of employing that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's actually quite a few that are doing that. It's, it's very expensive. I've tried to do that in some of my classes. It's just super expensive. Um, but for a lot, like they're doing that now for surgeries, they're doing it for medical care, they're doing it for pilot training, simulation, but they're trying to do more and more of simulation type things um, for emergency response and decision making under pressure. It's just like I said, I, mean, I don't have a computer skill to do some of that stuff, and so to bring somebody in and hire them, because I've looked at various ways to do that, and the cheapest uh, one was like 10,000 bucks. So, but if you know how to do that, if you've got somebody in the Mountaineering audience, um, who was really good with that kind of stuff. Uh, video training, video editing, and all that. You can actually do some of those things yourself. Any other questions? Yeah? When you're ramping up the stress factor in scenarios, is it important to have already built a certain level of mastery or skill? Oh, sure, you bet. Oh, I'm sorry. So she said, if you, uh, so go ahead, could you just say it louder? She has to just re repeat the question. Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, when ramping up the stress, Yeah, very much so. And so basically the reason, so that's going to be your, your pedagogy, right? Your sequential learning. Is that if you're not ready for it, I'm just going to pummel you, right? And so what I need to do is, and that's where we really just go back to just normal teaching. First you need to become familiar, then you need to practice, and then I say, okay, you ready for this? Right? So I make sure you have some skills, you have a little bit of confidence, and then as a teacher, I also need to know how hard to push you, right? So like with the video camera, if I get in your face, as soon as I see that deer in the headlights, it's not going to help you for me to just humiliate you, right? So then I turn that camera off. I, if I see somebody, and I've seen this, where they're all just fine, right? I turn that camera on, and look, quiver, the eyes get big, and I'm like, turn that off, and I'm like, that's not where I want to go with this. So then I say, all right, just, so I'm just going to put the camera away, and let's just do it without the camera. Right? And so because I'm really good at what stresses us out and what does, what makes us feel better, I will just take those tools as I need to. So if I think, okay, I just need you to, right now, to go back to what you just said, I'm going to give you a little bit of stress. Right? And then I'm going to say, okay, you ready for the next one? And now I'm going to make a lot of white noise. Right? So if, if you can imagine, like, the storm on McKinley I'm talking about, I mean, one thing that people don't realize is how loud that wind is. Right? I mean, it is like all the time. And so I say to Ambrose, I get into his ear, I think we need to bivy. And he says, What? <laughs> so, but it's, I mean, add noise, add noise to scenarios, highly stressful. Right? And so just, you do a little bit, you do a little more. So I actually, one of the things I do for even a whooper scenario is I do, I mean, a lot of guys have had the whooper, but I'll do a car accident. The radio's blaring, the person's leaning over the horn, ah! there's smoke coming out of the hood. Again, I'm adding as many stressors as I can, depending on where you are in your training. If you're not quite ready for it, then I'm just going to add a couple. Yeah? Uh, 
I think in that book, it's on combat, is that? Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that he, he mentions that as uh, uh, stress inoculation. Yes, that's exactly what it is, yep. And so speaking of, here are the references. And you guys can have the slideshow. Um, I don't know if, uh, if there's any way I'm going to see it to the Mountaineers, but you guys are more than welcome to you have this, use it. But these are pretty good, and these are quite good. So, and I got, so I'll go back to, this is the John Lee school that I talked about. He's the guy that came up with the bell curve. Uh, he's the Brit. It's pretty dry, a little hard to get a hold of, but it's still a good book. Um, this is actually a very, it's well written and fascinating. She's simply a writer. She's a writer who does scientific stuff, and she's taken, I don't know, maybe 10 case studies. There was a, a good one was in uh, Cincinnati. Uh, it was a restaurant lounge fire. And I don't know if you guys have heard about that, but there were like, Super wild because it was kind of like this, and there's a, a we'll say up here, and there's basically a stage, and musicians are playing, and this, the thing behind them started on fire, and then they leave. And this kid, this like 18 year old bus boy, he's like, Oh, this is weird. And he's like, They're just sitting there, and there's a fire. And he said, I think we should leave. And they just looked at him and they kept eating. They had, like, there were people burned sitting at their table. Walking you through that. Okay? This one here, the thinking fast is slow. This is the thinking fast, it's the limit system. The thinking slow is the prefrontal cortex. This is a pretty fun one. Um, I just reread this one. And he's a, again, he's not a, a scientist, but he's a good science writer, and he gives just a lot of data on what's happening in here. Another trivial pursuit fact is there's this thing called neuropeptide Y, just a chemical, and they have found if you've been highly, highly um, stimulated, like a traumatic event, and they can give you neuropeptide life really, really quickly, you don't get post-traumatic stress. And so, but there's actually a downside to that is you can also torture somebody and give them neuropeptide Y and perhaps ethically get away with it, right? It's very controversial, but he talks about that kind of stuff. So this is a pretty good one. This is the one that I just talked about, so I like um, Anders Ericsson quite a bit. And this has more to do with what makes people really, really good, how do you get them there. This is okay, not great. This is okay, not great. These both have like a couple chapters that I think are absolutely worth it, but out of the whole book, a couple chapters. This one right here is really good, right? This one right here, if you want to learn to become a better teacher, um, I would encourage you to get this one. But these guys are Australian, so it can be a little hard to get in the United States. That's a very good one. So I think the time is up, so thank you very much.